Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. My name's Emily Russell, for those of y'all that don't know me. And I have the pleasure of doing the marketing here at Clearview. And one of my favorite parts of my job is getting to do a monthly lunch and learn for our community. Um, just like you guys, I send out a quarterly newsletter. So if you're not on that mailing list, be sure and write down your address today so I can add you to it. Be happy to do that. Doesn't cost anything. And you get updates from the hospital and information about new services and um, just different health things going on in general. Um, so February is Heart Health Month. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. Everything from commercials you see on TV to red pins that people might be wearing. February is the month of the heart. And I guess that kind of coincides with Valentine's Day as well. Kind of makes sense. Um, but we're excited to have with us today Dr. Joel Garrison. He's been on our Clearview team for almost six months now. Um, he joined us last September. And um, he and his wife, Camille, live here in Monroe. Um, and they just found out, I'm going to share your news, that they are expecting their first. So wonderful, right? So, um, so adding to Walton County and just the good people that are here. So we're excited to have them as part of our Cleary family. And he's a family practice doctor here in Monroe. And his office is actually getting ready to move to the brand new building up front. So if you're looking for a primary care physician, he'd love to see you. Yep. Um, he sees patients of all ages and with all sorts of different conditions and things going on. So um, so with no further ado, I'm going to let Dr. Garrison take it away and talk about heart health. All right. Thanks, Emily. You're welcome. Great. So um, I put together kind of a, a quick talk about how to keep your heart healthy. And so we'll dive into to some reasons why that's important and then we'll talk about some anatomy of the heart because I think that's important to understand what the heart is and what the heart does to help us understand why we need to keep it healthy and how we can keep it healthy and then we'll talk about the main things um, to do in everyday life to keep your heart healthy and this uh, this goes from everyone from babies to uh, teenagers up into adults um, everything we talk about is applicable to, to everyone for keeping their heart healthy so, um, kind of some background on heart health. Um, in the United States, since 1975, um, cardiovascular disease, the um, deaths from cardiovascular disease have declined by about 25% overall. So we're getting better. Um, can anyone guess why? Better diet. Better diet, yep. Exercise. Yeah. More knowledge about how to keep your heart healthy. Um, we also have uh, better medications we know how to treat certain conditions better and then the other big one is um, there's been a big decline in the rates of smokers so there's fewer smokers so we have better drugs better technology and fewer smokers out there keeping our hearts healthier however despite these remarkable declines cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of death in the united states and has become so worldwide so it's very important to keep your heart healthy. There was a study from 2009 to 2010 that looked at all of the cardiovascular disease related deaths in the United States and they found that half of them are attributable to five risk factors that everyone can modify in their daily life. So half of the deaths um, were potentially modifiable. Those five things to modify were uh, better control of elevated cholesterol, control of diabetes, control of high blood pressure, obesity, and working on being overweight, and smoking. And so we'll kind of come back to those as well. So factors that were associated in the same study with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease related deaths, that would be what we talked about, more activity, so staying active and diet as well, so daily consumption of fruits and vegetables. And also interestingly in the study, and there was a lot of press about it at the time, they all, the study also showed that daily consumption of a small amount of alcohol could also be beneficial for the heart. And I'm gonna kind of circle around to that towards the end of the talk. Um, so I don't want anyone to get too excited <laughs> because uh, we'll, we'll kind of go into the pros and cons of that at the end. All right, so um, let's go over kind of heart anatomy real quick and understand what the heart is, what it does, and how it works, and how we can keep it healthy. So our heart is uh, made up of muscular tissue in our body, um, and has four chambers, 
which are attached by four valves and our body takes in blood from our veins that's deoxygenated. It pumps it through the right atrium into the right ventricle and then sends it into our pulmonary system, into our uh, lungs, where the blood picks up oxygen. Then it comes back into the left side of our heart and pumps through the left atrium, left ventricle, and then goes out into the rest of the body via the aorta. So there'll be a quiz at the end. So. Um, <laughs> This is kind of a model of the heart. If you open it up, you can see the, the muscle in between here and the, the four chambers. The atria are much smaller than the ventricles, and the ventricles have much more muscle around them because they're the ones that are actually pumping it out to either the lungs or the rest of the body. So from the outside of the heart, what we can see is the heart is made up mostly of these muscle fibers. Again, because the main function of the heart is to contract and pump blood, squeeze the blood from one area into, through the valve into either the lungs or into the aorta for the rest of the body. So it's, you can compare that to a muscle in your arm, muscle in your leg. It's just a, a group of muscle tissues that works together and fires um, to squeeze blood into the rest of the body. Interestingly, interestingly enough, the heart also has its own electrical system. Uh, that is controlled separate from the rest of our body's electrical system, which is our brain. So, and that's, um, we have kind of two battery systems in the heart, um, one that fires right above the atria and one that fires right above the ventricles, and that's what causes the heart to contract. And so when there's conditions in the heart where you have a slow heartbeat or a fast heartbeat or even atrial fibrillation, those are issues with the electrical system of the heart. And so, how does the heart get blood flow? Well, the heart, like the rest of our muscles in our body, they need arteries. Um, sometimes it's, uh, we don't think about this because the heart pumps blood, and, but the heart doesn't absorb the blood that it pumps to give itself oxygen. Um, interesting enough, that's what amphibians do. And so if you look at different um, anatomy models and different animals, amphibians, they absorb their own blood from their heart while it pumps. But in humans, we need, um, and in mammals, we need arteries on the outside of our heart. And those are called your coronary arteries. And you can see they both originate from the aorta. So as the oxygenated blood is pumped out of the heart, the first two arteries they hit are the coronary arteries. And that goes and gives blood to the rest of the heart. So when we talk about someone having coronary artery disease, um, that means that the artery is blocked by plaque, which is a buildup from cholesterol, and not enough blood is getting through the artery to a certain part of the heart. And when a muscle doesn't get enough blood, just like if you're doing strenuous exercise and you're lifting something heavy and you do 50 curls with it, the muscle starts hurting. You're not getting enough blood to it. It needs to rest. So um, the heart constantly beats, constantly keeps going. And when there's blockage in the blood flow to a certain part of the heart through the artery system, um, it can get fatigued and worn out and you can end up having a heart attack. All right, so with that in mind, let's talk about modifying risk for heart disease. So we mentioned these earlier. Um, the major risk factors for cardiovascular disease are ones we can modify, and we consider them in all adults. So those are things like eating a healthy diet, and we'll go into each of these in more detail as well about what exactly it means to, to modify these risks. So those are diet, uh, avoiding smoking or stopping smoking, control of high blood pressure, control of high cholesterol, uh, making sure you're physically active so you're not staying inactive, uh, working on overweight and obesity and diabetes. What we know from studies is even if someone has a completely healthy heart, if they have five of those risk factors we talked about here, it's the equivalent to of having had a heart attack in the past. So it's just as bad on the heart. 
And also what we know is even if you just have diabetes, that's an equivalent to, to compared to patients who have either survived a heart attack or a stroke in the past. So it's really important and that's why as uh, physicians, we take so much um, care in folks with diabetes to try to help control that. All right, so let's go into each of those modifiable risk factors individually and see what we can do in our lives and what we can tell our friends and our families um, and how to stay heart healthy. So the first one is having a healthy diet. And what we know from studies is that individuals who have a healthy diet have a significantly lower risk of cardiovascular disease. So what does it mean to have a healthy diet? Well, that means, like we talked about earlier, to eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, fresh fruits and vegetables. Recommended servings is five fresh fruits and vegetables every day. Um, have a diet that's high in fiber, including cereals, um, whole grain rice, whole grain pastas, uh, things with good fiber in them. You can also get fiber from a lot of fruits and vegetables as well. Foods with a low glycemic index and a low glycemic load. What that means is uh, the sugars you eat, does your body absorb them quickly and you get a sugar spike or does your body take time to absorb them? And the best for our bodies is for sugar to be absorbed slowly. Uh, I think the best way to think about this is if you have a can of Coca-Cola. Uh, there's no fiber in that Coca-Cola, but there's a lot of refined sugar. And so when you drink that, your blood sugar spikes really high, really quick, because it gets absorbed quick. Um, and that's not the best for your heart, not the best for your body. Um, instead, if you think about, um, say, the, the fruit cup in front of you, there's fiber and there's other substances in the fruit that help your body to absorb it slowly. So while there's a lot of sugar in fruit, you absorb it slowly and your body utilizes that sugar better and you don't have a big sugar spike. So that's what it means with foods with a low glycemic index. <coughs> Next is to focus on eating monounsaturated fat rather than trans fatty acids or saturated fats. So it's good to think of fat as something that everyone needs and it's good for the body, but we wanna avoid bad fats. So bad fats are those that are solid at room temperature. So things like butter or margarine, good fats, are liquid at room temperature. Think of those as olive oil, canola oil, um, other type of seed oils. So that's what we should focus on. And then finally, eating plenty of omega-3 fatty acids. Does anyone know any examples of omega-3s? Fish. fish, yep. So freshwater fish, um, especially northern freshwater fish like salmon and tuna. Um, also nuts. So um, walnuts and almonds um, are a big source of omega-3 fatty acids. What omega-3 fatty acids are, it's um, part of the building block to the cells of our body. So the cell membrane is made up of uh, fatty acids and the omega-3 fatty acids are the good ones for our cells. Any questions about healthy diet? I have a question about yeah. the omega-3. Can you have too much of that? No, you like cannot. If you take, uh, I take the omega-3 vitamin, and yep. then I eat salmon yep. also. Yep. And somebody told me that it's too much. Like, yeah. So with good substances for your body, it'll utilize them, and then it'll kind of, um, similar to vitamin C, where if, if your body's having an excess, it will remove it without building up a toxic level. So, yeah. cuts were not meant to be open. Yeah, they're, they're hard to get into. <laughs> All right. The next uh, modifiable risk for heart health, um, and arguably the biggest, is smoking avoidance and cessation, so stopping smoking. So cigarette smoking remains the leading avoidable cause of premature death and major avoidable cause of disability in the United States. And what we know is that your body is incredible at healing itself if you take away something that's hurting it. So the benefits of stopping smoking begin to appear only after a few months. 
and they reached that of a non-smoker in several years, eating am even among elderly patients. So it doesn't matter for your heart how long or how much you have smoked. The most important thing is stopping and letting your body start healing. Um, I put a little caveat in there. The opposite is true for cancer. So uh, it's never too late to quit for the heart, where, whereas it's never too early to quit for cancer. Any questions? Yes. This, I know they have all these things about secondhand smoke. Mm -hmm. Do that, does that affect the heart as well, or is that it just does. respiratory? Mm -hmm. Yep, the, it does have the same effects as smoking. Yep. The next modifiable risk is high blood pressure control. <coughs> so high blood pressure or hypertension um, is a risk factor for coronary, uh, carot I'm sorry, uh, cardiovascular disease, um, including stroke, heart disease, heart failure, and sudden death. Uh, unfortunately, some folks with high blood pressure, it's just a consequence of having birthdays. It runs in the family, and as you get older, um, your blood pressure starts to rise. So that's why the, the modifiable risk is not stopping high blood pressure, it's controlling high blood pressure and using good medications. Uh, in the medical field, we define having high blood pressure as having the top number, the systolic above 140, or the bottom number above 90, and it's either or. So it's not you have to have both, it's one or the other. And the key there is uh, you know, having good follow-up with a healthcare provider and making sure your blood pressure is controlled to be healthy for your heart. And there's lots of medicines out there. Um, and they've been around for a long time, and some folks have bad reactions to some, but better to others. So uh, don't let that deter you from making sure your blood pressure is well controlled. There's a lot of options out there. Yes. Is that uh, really the normal range for high blood pressure? Uh, one time uh, my doctor told me it should be 120 over 85. So 120 over 80 is normal. That's what the normal blood pressure range is. 80. We define high blood pressure as when it gets over 140 over 90. Um, oh, okay, I used to think one uh, forty was high power. I was so one twenty over eighty or eighty-five. Yep, and then and so there's there's different ranges. Once you get into one thirty over eighty-five, that's called pre-hypertension or pre-high blood pressure. Yep. and there's different treatment goals in different individuals as well. So depending on uh, any other medical conditions like high cholesterol or diabetes. Your goal for your blood pressure might be 120 over 80, it might be 130 over 85, it might be 140 over 90. Um, it depends just uh, kind of individually. Yep. The next uh, modifiable risk factor is high cholesterol. Um, and what we know from a lot of studies um, and looking over thousands and thousands of patients is that cholesterol lowering drugs such as statins um, have a clinical benefit on cardiovascular disease, including heart attack, stroke, and death. And that's for patients with and without existing um, cardiovascular disease. And so sometimes you, you read something like that and you wonder, well, why isn't everyone on SAD if it's so good? Um, and it's all kind of individualized depending on your own risks for heart disease. Uh, we'll say with uh, folks later in life, most of them do end up being on a cholesterol-lowering drug. Um, again, the, the goal there is to control the cholesterol. Um, and we can modify it as much as we can with our diet and our lifestyle. Uh, but sometimes it's a genetic issue. It runs in the family. Um, and the, the goal is to control it. Next modifiable risk uh, is physical activity. So staying inactive increases your risk for death and disability from uh, heart disease. So we talked about this, I think, a few months ago with uh, ways to stay active and healthy. But um, So the recommendation for your heart is to have moderate intensity exercise for 150 minutes a week or vigorous intensity exercise for 75 minutes a week or an equivalent combination of those activities. So if you break that down, it's about 30 minutes of moderate activity 
uh, five days a week. And examples of moderate activity could be going on a walk, um, riding a stationary bike at a slow pace, uh, doing gardening or yard work around the house. Examples of vigorous intensity activity would be jogging or running, um, riding a bike at a fast pace, uh, playing tennis, something where it's uh, much more um, much more of a workout on the body. Well, I have a question on that. Mm -hmm. I cannot do a lot of walking because my knees gives me problems. And uh, but I'm very active in mm -hmm. what I do daily. Yep. But you don't find me running, walking, and going nowhere doing exercise. Now my movement. Sure. Yeah, down and everywhere. Is that okay? Is that helping you? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. And so, in um, in that in your scenario, the key is to stay active and I'm moving. Active. Yep. But I just can't help walking and running. But no, yep. <coughs> and um, of course, that that comes with um, knee problems or hip problems, and some folks can't do the exercise. And so, in in those folks, the key is to stay active. Okay. Well, what what would help my knees? <laughs> New ones. <laughs> New ones, yeah. I got to do some braces on there. I got braces on there. Yep, so a lot of times, um, you know, doing some muscle strengthening exercises. Um, so some leg lifts or some squats can help with strengthening the muscles around the knee to help take pressure off the knee. Sometimes braces help. Uh, sometimes the, the ice packs, the heat packs. I get the braces. Yep. I even sleep in them. Yep. <coughs> All right, so the next modifiable risk for keeping your heart healthy would be weight loss. Um, so we know over the past um, several decades that in the United States and worldwide, obesity is uh, overtaking cigarettes as the leading avoidable cause of premature deaths. Um, and the risk for the heart includes um, increased high blood pressure, increased high cholesterol, and diabetes as well as prediabetes. And so that's our big concern with um, <laughs> folks with obesity or overweight is that they increase the risk for other conditions that cause heart disease as well. The next modifiable risk for the heart is management of type 2 diabetes. Uh, so I like to think of diabetes as a, as a fluid uh, process. You know, I don't label people as uh, you have diabetes and you'll always have diabetes. There are ways to reverse diabetes and completely uh, restructure the body to function well. So the risk factors with diabetes includes on the large scale, we have heart disease, stroke, peripheral artery disease, which may affect blood flow to the legs. And then on the smaller scale, we have the problems with the eyes, problems with the kidneys, um, neuropathy, so nerve pain. Um, and the, so the key here, again, man, properly managing and reversing type 2 diabetes. Okay, and then I said we would circle back around to the talk about the benefit and risk of small amounts of daily alcohol. So uh, what we know from studies is that individuals who consume a small amount of alcohol every day have a lower risk of heart disease than that of non-drinkers. And the benefit seems related to the small amount of alcohol consumed rather than the type of alcoholic beverage. So there was thought uh, that the Mediterranean diet, you may have heard of, um, folks on the Mediterranean drink a glass of red wine every day and they thought it was the red wine that was um, conferring the benefit on the heart. But the studies showed that it was actually just the uh, small amount of alcohol itself, not necessarily the red wine. However, any benefit of small daily alcohol intake must be weighed against the risk, um, which include, so if you, uh, you could have higher blood pressure with daily alcohol drinking, you increase your risk for brain hemorrhage or brain <coughs> bleed. And the other big concerning uh, factor in women with daily alcohol is breast cancer. And the most recent studies show one drink a day for women increases the risk of breast cancer. 
So uh, my recommendation is alcohol in moderation. So one drink a day may or may not be appropriate for you depending on uh, your history, your lifestyle, and those other uh, factors. But it's good to ha kind of have that discussion with your healthcare provider um, to go over your history and what other conditions you might have, what other risk factors you might have uh, before deciding you're going to have a, a glass of wine every night to help your heart. Okay, finally I wanted to mention aspirin uh, because we hear everything that aspirin is good for the heart. Uh, what, how aspirin works is it uh, works as a kind of a mild blood thinner. So anyone who takes a aspirin a day knows if they bump their arm into something or bump their leg, they'll, <coughs> they'll bruise easier. Um, and that's how it works on the heart too. So it prevents the blood from clotting. If you do have a blockage in your heart um, or in your brain, it would prevent the blood from clotting and causing a heart attack or a stroke. However, since it does thin your blood, it also increases your risk for bleeding, especially in the GI tract, so in your stomach or your intestine or your colon. And that can be very dangerous. It can lead to a lot of blood loss. Um, so what the recommendation is, they say for low risk patients, this is for patients with low risk of cardiovascular disease, the benefit does not outweigh the risk of major bleeding. So for those patients, they do not recommend a daily aspirin. However, for patients with moderate or high risk for heart disease, they may benefit from a daily aspirin if they don't have any risk factors for major bleeding. And that would be a prior bleed, um, a prior uh, stroke, um, a prior GI issue. I've got a question. <coughs> yes. What's an alternative medication that you can take if you can't take aspirin? Is there anything? For prevention of heart uh -huh. disease? I was just so. curious about that. If there was anything else over the counter that you could take that so um, no other medication. Uh, the goal then would be to work on the other modified okay. risk factors, which would be... Because I have Barrett's esophagus and I can't take any mm, The aspirin, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then uh, the other focus would be on the dietary measures and the activity measures, okay. making sure you're getting exercise, getting those omega-3s, <laughs> um, eating the, um, the good fats in your diet, not the bad fats. Yep. Does this include also the low-dose aspirin, like the small? It does. Yep, includes the, the 81 milligram low-dose uh, or baby aspirin. Yep. So the official recommendation is an informed decision should include um, whether to add aspirin. And again, that's a personalized decision between you and your healthcare provider based off your own history and risk factors. Okay, and that, that kind of sums up the, the recommendations. Any uh, general questions? Is the risk for taking Redoxa really what you see on TV about the bleeding? It is. Hey, I'm on Redoxa mm -hmm. and I have been for, I don't know, about three, four months now. Yeah, but so the, and um, unfortunately those TV commercials, <laughs> they, they really emphasize the bad risks. Right. The, um, but that it is a blood thinner, and uh, the benefit to that medicine is compared to warfarin or the coumadin, you don't have to have frequent blood checks, blood check. and um, it's warfarin, it's easier to get toxic levels or be too high. Um, so, with medicines like Pradaxa, it's easier for patients to take, and there's less <coughs> risk of um, bleeding. But there still is, with any blood thinner, including aspirin, risk of bleeding. Yeah.